Hi, I'm David. Hi, I'm Jordan, and we're students from George Washington Middle School in Dubuque, Iowa. I'm Megan. I'm Mark. I'm Randy, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. I have a joke. What's the only vegetable you can find on the pool table? Uh, no. A cucumber. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce the executive chef for Kids in the Kitchen, Jim Terry. Come on in, Jim. Okay. Hello. What Greetings. are we going to cook today, Jim? We are going to make creme brulee today. And uh, it's a somewhat dangerous dessert to make and uh, also to eat, depending on how you run your diet regularly. It's certainly the least healthful thing we'll ever make on the show, but it is so delicious, it's worth doing every once in a while. We're in a high vee store. Before we start cooking, we have to go shopping with the chef. What's the recipe called for, Jim? Five ingredients, very straightforward ones they are. Uh, organic eggs, heavy cream, sugar, vanilla bean, and excellent quality vanilla extract. And joining us today is Megan Dalsing, a registered dietitian. Thank you guys. Well, I'm glad to have you here at the Hy-Vee store and let's get shopping for our ingredients. Let's go to the health market. Why do you need organic? Well, we like to support that if we can. It's not, you don't have to, but part of the thrust of what we do is to choose the, the best, the cleanest sources of food ingredients that we can get. Jim, why organic eggs? I like to support this kind of agriculture. I like to support the idea of getting eggs from creatures that have had a chance to run around and lead a more natural existence than your standard battery chicken, which is something you either want to check into or you don't, depending on your level of tolerance and your squeamishness level, that kind of thing. So uh, it, I feel better about it. Uh, it might be just a touchy-feely emotional thing, but because all the research isn't in yet as far as, you know, is it more nutritious for you? It really depends on your point of view as to how you relate to the foods you eat. Do you care where it came from? Do you care how it was made? Do you care how it affects you? Is it all about, does it fill me up? Does it taste good? Uh, hopefully it's somewhere in between. Hopefully your food can taste good and fill you up, but also come from great sources that are going to support good agriculture and good nutrition. Jim, we have some Organic Valley Heavy Whipping Cream here. Will that work for our recipe? I've used Organic Valley products for over 15 years. I'm always delighted to see them on the shelf. Great, we'll put them in the cart. Excellent. Get them off the shelf. <laughs> Just two, right? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Meaning that the people who actually go through the trouble and work of producing the vanilla, which is an extremely complex process. Vanilla, actually, as we know it, cannot exist without human intervention. It comes from an orchid. I believe it is the only orchid-related product that we actually eat. And uh, it has to be pollinated by hand. People have to pollinate vanilla in order to get it. And when it grows, it's this big, long, green bean. You'll see the final vanilla bean later, and we'll look at more into this in detail at some point, or not, depending on the time available to us. But uh, it has to be fermented, it has to be dried in the sun, it has to be boiled. All this stuff has to happen to it before it develops the flavor that you know as vanilla. Anyway, we got the extract, that's what we need. That can go into the cart. Oh, and here's a vanilla bean! Excellent! Oh, this is the real stuff. Okay, fantastic. I'm doing my part for the kids in the kitchen. So we got a small pack. That or that we've got right. this organic. Organic forgot. Let's see what we got going here. This is very similar. And really, you know, yeah, let's put this in the cart. I got some stuff. I got some stuff back in the place. Okay. This will probably work. Lovely. Organic sugar. It's evaporated cane juice. The difference between this sugar and what you would, you know, normally get in the regular baking aisle is the degree of intervention. You know, how heavily has this been refined? How much of the minerals? Sugar cane is really not a bad thing. And uh, in it. Sugarcane juice actually has significant mineral content and all kinds of goodies, which gets stripped out in the refining process. So here you get something that's much less refined and uh, again comes from you know organic sources, not, not heavily chemicalized in any way. So you can actually get some stuff out of it. I wouldn't make it a, a cornerstone of your diet, but as far as a sweetener goes, it's an excellent balanced sweetener to use in moderation. So it tastes better? It tastes good. Better? 
It's a great, I mean, a lot of people, you, you like the things you like, particularly from when you were really young, the flavors you've always had. You know, canned, canned corn, you know, that some people really like canned corn, you know, well, some people don't. But it's one of those things you develop an affinity for. I mean, you, people can get to like really horrific things and just crave it all day long. Coffee, I mean, who, just drink coffee without, without a bunch of sugar and cream in it, which is the way most people drink it, apparently. But a lot of people, you know, get that taste for black coffee. It's bitter, it's astringent, it's nasty. Who would possibly want to drink that stuff? But after a while, you start craving it. And, uh, yes, exactly right. <laughs> All right, Long we're good. Time. We have sugar. <laughs> the organic food area in our health market has actually grown um, quite a bit. It you see the grocery uh, business staying pretty um, level, but the organic foods are um, increasing in sales every year. So we've had great success with our health markets, and people are really concerned about what they're putting in their bodies. Okay, we've been parceling out some of the tasks. About half of it is in production. The other half is going to get ready to produce the rest of what's going on here. Our eggs are being separated. All we want for this recipe is the yolks. Whites can be retained separately for other recipes, like making a, a genoise cake or something along those lines. Um, but we need to get as much of the white, the clear part of the egg, out of there as possible, because it really affects the texture of the finished brulee. So they're being very careful. Assiduous, I might even say. Perspicacious in their pursuits. And before we get too alliterative, we're going to move on to the vanilla Tedious. bean over here. Tedious. <laughs> well, that's only the, that's a state of mind. Uh, here's the bean, right? In its final state, it's been uh, pollinated, harvested, uh, boiled, sun-dried, fermented, and it gets to this point. And uh, what you are going to do is cut it in half this way. We were working on our nice skills a little bit earlier. We're going to bisect it, and then we're going to cut each half in half the long way and scrape out the thousands of little seeds that are inside. Maybe more than thousands. I've never actually counted them. It looks almost like very, very fine dark sugar inside. This is essentially a seed pod, but the whole thing has fantastic vanilla aroma and flavor. So we want to get all those things out, so when we throw them into our custard, we'll have these wonderful little uh, black flecks that are floating through the brulee. And that's actually one of our measurements of a, of a good texture in the, in the next stage, which I'll show you. So have at it. You confident? Excellent. Superb. Straight down. down. Yeah, man. All the way down. Cut it in half. Might take a little of that extra force. Yeah. yeah. If it's resisting, you know what you do? You want to get more leverage in? Using this part, you've only got the tip of the knife, and you don't have very much power. If you have the tip down like this, and you have your hand over the top like I showed you, like this, and you push down, you've got all of this leverage. And you can put your body weight into it, and you're going to be able to chop. See? It's done. You see how fast and easy that was? Completely different uh, relationship with the knife because of how you've got it. Yeah, open that up, Burf, perfect. Same kind of idea. You're there, done. You just heard it go through, that's that. And actually halfway is far enough on that because you want to open it up. Get yourself centered, you're good to go. All right, we'll be back to scrape those things out in a second. How's the eggs coming along? You guys are making fantastic progress there. Now, what we found is we talked earlier about how we might need to re-homogenize the cream because cream that hasn't been um, dealt with too severely in the processing phase, we are going to sort of, not really technically, but in a way we're going to rehomogenize the cream. We're going to get some of the clumps of uh, heavier cream material sort of regrouped back in here so we have a real smooth cream. We got some lumps, and that'll happen when cream sits out, particularly natural cream that hasn't been uh, heavily treated. And there we are. We have a pretty nice... Oh, that's lovely. Okay. So now we're start, we have our, our cream nicely homogenized. Now what we're going to do is we're going to whisk it up in here. Have you got the whisk right there? Yeah, I got it right here. Excellent. Now if you will take the sugar and kind of, let's get the, this in there. If you'll uh, go ahead and pour that in while you're whisking, a little bit at a time. Slow but steady and just keep, and whisk away. You want to get that all incorporated. The whole idea is to, you want to avoid clumps. And this will help the sugar dissolve more evenly into the cream. That's good. And how are you doing here? Oh, good. Yeah, you, you got the ticket. Let me show you a little trick with that, because you've you got the right concept there, and you got a lot of them out already. That's very good. An easy way to do it, too, is to hold it down like this and just glide like this. With a knife, you don't want to be sliding it along the board like this, because that'll dull your blade. And uh, some chefs are very particular about their knives and have very special knives, handmade knives sometimes, that they would, their eyes would be popping out of their head in horror just even watching us do this. But uh, this knife was meant for this kind of work. And uh, likewise here, too. Yeah, you got this open very nicely. And we'll scrape it open. You see how it's all coming out? And actually, it, it doesn't even all have to come out because the action of the hot cream upon the interior of this is going to help bring the other ones out. But look how fine. Can you even see that those are tiny little individual seeds? Yeah. It's just unbelievably fine. So we're going to scrape all of this. 
into the cream over there. All right, here we go. Pardon me one second. Let's toss this in. Are you good? There aren't any more eggs. Okay, lovely. If you will put that on the scale and see how close to 14 ounces we are, that would be excellent. What we're doing oh, with those egg strong. yolks... Hmm? That's strong. Oh, yeah. Real older. stuff. It's 16. Oh, okay. So we got a little extra. That's cool. Now, we didn't zero it, did we? You didn't, we didn't turn the dial to zero? We left it where it was with the tear weight? Are we looking at about under two, like uh, two ounces under zero there? Yeah, it's, it's two ounces under. Good, good. All right, so we have slightly more eggs than we require, so that's fantastic. Keep whisking. Yes, give that a good whisking now and incorporate all that stuff. Good, now we want to crank this up to high speed because we are just about ready to rock and roll and making our custard. Now watch out. Yeah, the flames are going to lick up around the outside a little bit. I don't want you to get smoked. Yeah. That would be bad. Uh, last time I made a brulee, I scorched my finger, and this is the danger zone here, because we're going to have live fire and torches happening. So one of the really important things about this recipe, even though the show is called Kids in the Kitchen, this is called Kids, Get Your Family Involved in the Kitchen, particularly somebody who has experience with high-intensity propane torches, because that's one of the keys to making this thing work. There are uh, home kitchen versions of them, and I was just talking with someone about earlier today, that you can get at the, some of the kitchen supply places that are kind of sprouting up in most people's towns. Right in Dubuque, we have a new one. Uh, over on uh, JFK, and you can, it's a smaller thing, smaller flame, but it will caramelize the sugar on top and make the crispy topping, and that's the whole point of this flame and the sugar in the first place. So, okay, we are good here, and we have maybe just a little bit more yolk than anticipated. I thought we'd really need all of these. Yeah, no, we have slightly too much, so I'm going to pour a little bit of this off. <whistles> are all good? Okay. Excellent. A little over 14. That's just where we want to be. Now, uh, we, we need to get this. That's excellent. That's nicely combined. I'm going to take this whisk over here now. We need to whisk in. We have somebody who didn't do anything. Uh, Jordan. You didn't get to do anything. You are going to add the critical ingredient because we have the vanilla bean in here, but this excellent vanilla extract really um, increases the amplitude of the flavor uh, a little bit, which is very important. Jim, what's amplitude of the flavor? Um, well, actually, amplitude in this situation is a malapropism because it has nothing to do with food. Amplitude is a measurement of sound intensity, isn't it, roughly? But uh, I'm using it creatively, if improperly, to get across the idea that we want to increase the, the volume of flavor, the intensity of the flavor. So that's probably the word that I should have used. So if you will take and put, in the local vernacular, uh, this much of that vanilla in there. You could also use maybe a cap and a half, too, if you prefer. But uh, get this from here into one of these and then into there. Is this good? Yeah, that's good. And you want to whisk that in. But you want to keep whisking because the whole idea, what we're doing here is we, are, we want to bring those yolks quickly up to a state of warmth and then immediately pour the scalding, boiling cream into it. The reason for the necessity for speed is because uh, when you're studying um, health and sanitation in order to, to be a, pr a restaurant owner or a practicing chef, uh, you learn about the danger zone for dangerous ingredients. And eggs are considered a pretty dangerous ingredient because they have a propensity to produce or to harbor dangerous microorganisms that can make you sick. That's why they say you'll see it on menus in different places. Don't eat undercooked eggs if you have a compromised immune system, if you're, you know, if you're really like a baby, or if you're maybe a very elderly person or someone who's got a, a, a condition that it makes it important for you not to have things that could harbor uh, even a slight increase in microorganisms. There is no sterile food. You know, there isn't any. It's just a concept. Sorry. So, so why do people um, eat the egg yolks like when they're like doing exercise or something, they like eat the plain egg yolks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's been kind of a tradition for a long time. Eggs are wonderfully convertible protein, and oh, even protein. though they do have a lot of cholesterol in the yolk, there's a significant amount of lecithin in the white, which some people say kind of counteracts that. A lot of it has to do with individual body chemistry, you know, what your metabolism's doing. Megan would know way more about this than I would, and would be able to explain it better probably. But you know, that's my take on it anyway to get us through this question right now. Raw eggs consumption is like in the movies Rocky Balboa and stuff. Oh yeah, first time I saw something like that. And not only was it raw, but it was like not even mixed up or anything. It was just the, the sloppy whites and the yolks all in there in a, in a mass, and you just glugging it down out of a pitcher. So I think that turned a few stomachs, and it was an amusing sequence too. It had great humor. But uh, I don't do that on a regular basis, though I did grow up in a sort of a, a second household of my best friend whose older brother ate a dozen loosely scrambled eggs that he would throw on top of a loaf of white bread and then cram it down. He fried it up in bacon grease. And he just, he sort of warmed up the raw, sloppy eggs. He was a heavy trainer. He lifted weights all the time, and he got pretty big. But I don't know what his health was overall. Tim Terry is an encyclopedia of knowledge. <laughs> uh, wait till we get the hot water bath going. We're just about there. 
How is our, uh, are we going to about to boil over there by any chance with the cream? Um, no, it's just... Is there any steam happening? Yes. yes. Oh, excellent. That's what we want. If you would damp down the flame on that just a little bit, if you just yeah. turn it so the flame gets a little bit lower, and then we're going to be ready to make our custard, and it's going to be just fantastic. So, pardon me one second. Let's get this back in there. I think the cream is getting very close. I see. We're cooking. Yeah, we need to do this a little bit more. Our goal here is to... What we want to do is have all of that get in contact with the warm exterior as much as possible, and that's going to transfer the heat faster, and we're going to raise the temperature of the yolks so that when we add the hot cream, it's going to form a really nice custard, which is the goal. If it does not form a custard, meaning if it does not thicken enough, and the, the barometer we're looking for here, so, so to speak, again, those little flecks, those little tiny, almost you know, really, really small seeds that we saw inside the vanilla bean itself, if they will float in our resultant custard, we know it's going to be great all the way through. If they sink, and then we cook off our custards, all the vanilla beans are going to be at the bottom of the cup. And I have been to many well-reputed restaurants where all the vanilla seeds are at the bottom of the creme brulee cup. Ah, 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 that right away shows me they didn't make a proper custard in the first place. So there's many fine points of this whole issue. Out of sheer curiosity, does anybody here in the kitchen today feel like they're thinking, you know, a career in the food business might be something I'd be looking at? Me. <laughs> Indeed. Interesting. Okay. What, what part of it, though? What do you think you'd like to do in the business? Um, I'd like to cook, basically, and I'd like to work for the Food Network someday. Oh, 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 I'd like to have a career in the food business. I'm going to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> An honorable pursuit. Okay, I think we're doing pretty well there. Let's, uh, let's see where we're at here. Pardon me one moment. Oh, this is outstanding. We're there. Okay, I'm going to borrow the whisk. Okay, now we see our steam happening. Now, this is a, one of the very dangerous parts of the whole thing, because what's going to happen any second is, this is going to start to foam and boil over. And if you're not watching it, if you're talking on the phone, if somebody walks into the room, if the dog is making a nuisance or something, then you've got an issue, because it's going to boil over. And what's going to happen is, the crustified burnt sugar and cream combination is going to adhere to the surface of this, like... Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the stuff they used to paint barns with? I think it was a milk paint. It was made of a combination of dried milk and blood. That's what the red barn paint used to be, wasn't it? And they paint the barns with it. Try to get that stuff off. It stays on. Uh, and this is like that. So you don't want the messy cleanup, and you don't want to lose your stuff. You don't want to fill the place with acrid smoke that just sticks to the back of your throat. Horrendous. But we're almost there. But it must actually foam and bubble slightly to know it's hot enough, and then whew, we toss it in with the egg yolks. We whisk everything up, and hopefully, hopefully, it's going to form a perfect custard, and we are just seconds away from that right now. Now, what we need to do in the meantime is, I, I must charge someone, and I'm going to charge you with this, because you, you had a, a cameo in this particular production. So if you'll go over here and get the hottest water you can, put about a quarter of an inch of that water in here. You know what I'm going to do, too? I'm going to give you these so it's not such a shock when you see how much these things fill it up. If you could get, like, that much water in here without getting water in these cups, we're going to be all right. There's a misconception about vanilla that's gotten into our culture, and it was, it's been in advertising and popular media for the past 10, 15 years. Whenever anything, here we go. That story's going to have to wait a second, because look at what we got. You see this, this bubbling around the edge? Yeah. It's starting to happen. And we're going to have a gigantic explosion of foaming cream in a couple of seconds. We need to make sure that it's just that hot all the way through. If it's just happening at the corner, it ain't there yet. That is to say, it has not attained the requisite temperature. Can you see? Oh, yeah, yeah. Lovely. It's starting to rise. It's actually rising in the pan. We shut it off. How do you know when to turn it off? Uh, it's starting to rise in the pan. We shut it off. Because it, otherwise it's going to rise over and we're in deep, deep trouble. Now, let us go over here to the egg yolks, which you have carefully prepared and measured. Make a little bit of room over here. Pardon me. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to pour a little bit in first, like so. Just enough to kind of get the yolks ready for the concept oh, of this hot cream getting on it. Because if we pour all of it in at once, there's the risk of curdling the eggs prematurely, and then we got a bunch of sugary, vanilla-flavored scrambled eggs, and that's what we don't want. Oh my God. This is a, not a very attractive container, but it really helps us pour. And I'll, show, I'll demonstrate that later. That's why we're not using a clear thing. Oh, it's getting thicker, I think. I hope. Now, what we're looking for... We're looking for that, it's going to start gelling. It looks very loose now. But now, do you see how quickly it stopped flopping about? Yeah. Surface tension kind of got into play here. Now let's give it another, oh, we can feel it. We can feel it. It's starting to resist. Here, run the, run the whisk around in there. And do you feel how it kind of resists the whisk? Yeah. That's what we're looking for. You want it to have that, that latex paint consistency. Mm -hmm. And uh, it feels like there's something on the bottom. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, we don't. If there is, that could be that the bottom of the pot is too hot, right, and we've yeah. curdled somewhat. If we have, eh, we can probably salvage it, but we we want to avoid that. That's why we got it off the burner right away. You shut that flame off, and you keep it away from it. Let's get back to this, and we are going to. If I can have that, we're going to pour this through our chinois. The chinois is a very, very tight, fine mesh. This is not a medium mesh strainer. It's not a hole punch. Uh, sometimes a china cap, which you'll see is a conical strainer that has holes punched in it. Uh, we actually used one of those last week for corn soup. But uh, this, as you can see, is just almost like finely, it's like woven, a fine mesh, a fabric of stainless steel, very heavy. These are not inexpensive. Uh, retail cost of something like this would be between $80 and $120 for one of these strainers. Now, let's strain this through that because we want to make sure that everything that's in here Oh, this is, oh, hope it isn't too thick. No, look at this. This is, this is picture-perfect custard. Look, can you, can you see this? Oh, I'm proud of this. You guys done good today. Excellent. Look at that. First time out of the gate. <laughs> okay. So, behold. We pour it through, and we see that we have minimal clumpage at the bottom. That's also very nice. Good distribution. These thick pans really distribute the heat well. You can do it in a stainless pot, too, but uh, this is very nice. We have, oh, those rubber spatulas. Could you hand me one of those, please? Excellent. We want to scrape all of this fine custardy goodness out of here. Mmm, custardy goodness. We won't want to miss any of this. We might, we'll probably have a little too much, but uh, always better to have too much. Right. Now, we want to get our pan of custard cups. Oh, this is good. This is the right level. A hot water bath is really critical to the success of this dish. So we have these wonderful uh, little ramekins, fluted ramekins. And, uh, we're going to put them in the oven to kind of get them pre-warmed while we're straining out our, our custard here. So we're, we have our oven set at exactly 300 degrees. And we've checked it ahead of time to make sure that it is exactly 300 degrees because it's really kind of crucial also. The temperature is, it's got to be exact. There's a lot of freewheeling stuff you can do in cooking. You can improvise. That's one of the beauties of cooking. One of the joys of cooking is doing it your way, experimenting, creating your own expression, really. But with this one, slavish adherence. You've got to really follow this to the letter. There is an expanded, unbelievably detailed, very intimidating version of this recipe that you'll be able to find online, but it will give you all the details you need to make the perfect brulee. If you've watched carefully, you can probably wing it without, uh, without resorting to that, maybe, but uh, it's a resource. It's a resource, so it's on, it'll be online and uh, see if you can do it. Most people who have ever tried to make it, I'll warn you, have failed. <laughs> but you do it a few times, and you will not fail. Google Dubuque Schools and click on the fry pan that says Kids in the Kitchen. Do you want to check this out? If you will, I'm going to show you how they want you to be able to feel what I'm actually doing here. Because I've got a, I've got a little ladle here. What I'm doing is I'm pushing this stuff against the sides of the chinois. Because as you can see, it's so thick on its own, it it's not going to come through. But we want, to, we want to get all this stuff through, particularly all those little vanilla bean flecks. You want to, you want to check I it wonder out? what my mother's going to say when I want a chinois for my birthday. <laughs> Oh, you know, if folks are not willing to drop a C note on a, on a chinois, there's an alternative. You can take a, a cone strainer or even a, a mesh strainer that you have at home and line it with a couple of layers of cheesecloth. And while it was really tricky for me, I asked all my purveyors providing to my restaurant to get cheesecloth, and they were all saying, cheesecloth, what do you mean? What are you talking about? So I couldn't get it from any of my uh, regular suppliers. I came here to hy V. They've got cheesecloth here in the store. So... You know, go to, it, you can get it in a local grocery store, perhaps. So investigate. And then you, li oh, you line the strainer with the cheesecloth, and then just follow the recipe as it is. It is going to be a little bit lumpy, and you're going to have this cloth to deal with it. You can still push the custard through the cheesecloth with the ladle using the same kind of uh, technique that is being demonstrated here. What do we think? Have we got most of that out of there? Just about. Just okay. Well, we need to get it into the cup, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push it into high-speed production, if I may. Because I'm going to use, yeah, I'm going to use the, uh, the devastating speed method which is really funny because I don't do anything with Devastate. While this is still nice and hot, we're going to get it into these uh, fluted ramekins, and uh, let's do it. So what is a fluted ramekin? Ah, excellent question. And you know, I needed to bring this up earlier, and I failed to mention it, so I'm awfully glad this came up. Uh, a fluted ramekin is a straight-sided dish, and that's important, really, for this because the custard needs to cook evenly up and down. So if you have it in a flaring dish, uh, you're going to have an issue because the top is going to be more exposed to the heat and it's probably going to cook un unevenly depending on how deep the thing is. You can actually make significantly larger creme brulees. You can make it in a big dish like that clear one we have over there. That's a fluted ramekin. That would actually be called a small souffle dish. 
and uh, souffles are, whew, that would be a really fun thing to do. But those are extremely tricky. And uh, once you know how to do them, they're a great resource to have in your repertoire. And there's, uh, ooh, but you know what there is? There's the bread souffle, which isn't technically a real souffle at all, but those can be very hearty, very savory, and uh, you can make a meal out of them, and they're a blast to make. And if you make them in a, a clear container like that, they're really fun to watch because they bubble away and they get all nice and crusty on the outside and <laughs> fragrant with onions and cheese and herbs and <laughs> anything you want to put in there, bacon, you know, any, you know, if you have a penchant for that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. What's more aromatic and savory than that? Boy, Jimmy sound hungry. I was born hungry. <laughs> but weren't we all? Of course. Okay. Excellent. Look at that. Now, we want a little bit of surface tension. We want them really, really full. And you'll see the reason why later, because when we caramelize them, if the brulee, if the custard is sunken down into the dish, it's, it's, more, it's trickier. It's trickier to do, and you can't get as pretty of a caramelization. So we're going to very carefully take this across. Could I impose on you to open the door of that oven? Excellent. So we're going to set this up here. You, notice, you might notice, if you look in the back of the oven, there is a convection fan back there. But we're not activating that, because that's just too intense of a heat situation, and it dries out the top of the custards before they're ready to go. We've got it at 300 degrees. It's going to stay there until they're done, and there's a judgment call that has to be made, but we'll talk about that at that point. While we're waiting for our brulees to bake, and Jim, how long is that going to take? We're looking at three quarters of an hour to an hour, something like that. We'll need to check in on them. Okay. okay. We're going to join with Manners Make Magic. Welcome to Marriage Make Magic. I'm Marissa. I'm Kenny. And I'm Brian. And we're dining out today. Manners are important to the dining experience. Whether formal or casual situation, the rules are the same. Uh, when do we deploy the napkin? You know, I'm not sure. Do we do it right away or wait for the waiter? In this situation, I think we should call Manners Magnificent. Do you have a cell phone number? Um, Manners doesn't have a cell phone. He's magic. Let's pose this question to Manners the Magnificent. We call him by using the three magic words. Please? Thank you. You're welcome. You cold? Mary Poppins with a beard. When do we deploy the napkin? You would use your napkin immediately. So go ahead. And that should go immediately on your lap once you are seated. I have some napkin do's and don'ts. Kenny, one never uses the napkin as a washcloth. When your napkin is not used to protect your lap, it should be used to dab your mouth. When your napkin hits the floor, you're not to pick it up. Someone else will replace it. The rule that applies to napkins also applies to silverware. Anything that hits the floor should not be used again. Manners, I do have one more question for you. Yes? Could you get us some more rolls? Could you get us some more rolls, please? Yeah, that's what I meant. Hmm. Okay. We have made the judgment call on our texture with the brulee. We don't want them to be cooked hard. Uh, you really have to kind of watch them in the oven and see if they're, uh, if they're nicely skinned over. And uh, you'll see that happen relatively quickly. A momentum starts to develop after about 30, 40 minutes in the oven. You have to kind of watch. Then we pull them out. We chill them down. We've just pulled these out of the refrigerator. By definition, creme brulee is a chilled dessert. Now, you'll have some people serving them warm or serve them with strawberries on the bottom. At that point, it is no longer creme brulee. It is a custard with fruit in it, or it's a warm custard served in some other way. Creme brulee is chilled and then has a caramelized top. So because we have a dangerous fire-breathing instrument here, we are suggesting strongly that Somebody who's skilled with this and of an age where a lawsuit isn't going to ensue uh, actually activates it or instructs you closely on how to do it. We put about that much on. That looks to me like about maybe just under a tablespoon. We get a nice coating of it, not heaped up too high, spread it around a little bit, and now we're ready to go. I'm going to need a little bit of room. And I'm going to need to take off the safety. We kind of get it used to the idea. We kind of warm up all the sugar like so. And then we commence a rotation. This is how we do it anyway. We find we get a really nice result. Oh yeah, it's, it's melting. The sugar's actually caramelizing. That's a bonus question. Spell caramelize. It is not caramelize. You don't have to do that right now. 
That's a bonus question later. It'll be on the final exam. Anybody do that? Anybody been in a spelling competition? Aha! Thus the willingness to participate. I appreciate that. That's good. All right. And you see how this, this is a trigger activated one? It makes it very convenient. And look what we have. We have a wonderfully caramelized smoking custard. And that's going to sit, and, we, and you don't touch it because that is like molten lava. If that was to dribble off the side, which is very easy, that can create a burn that hurts like nothing you've ever had because you can't get it off. It adheres to your skin, and even if you put it in water, it continues to burn deep into your flesh. So other people will tend to, and rightly so, want to do this on a countertop. Traditionally, a salamander was used, and a salamander was a hot iron, uh, roughly this shape, but it could be other shapes. The point was that it was red hot, and you brought that in close enough proximity to cause the sugar to melt and caramelize. No open flame, uh, no gouts of hot sugar running over your hand. There are a lot of advantages to that. And uh, there's different forms of that. There also are much smaller torches that are available at the culinary stores that we were mentioning earlier today uh, that you can get that are not going to create this gigantic uh, turbocharged flame. Uh, so even a, a broiler, a household broiler, if you get the rack up close enough to the flame, but you really have to monitor and take it just to the point where it's reached this kind of a stage, you won't get this kind of an even result, but you will have a nicely caramelized and a much safer dessert. So that's probably a preferable way to do it. And that's something you can experiment with safely at home. I want to back out a little bit because it's going to caramelize too fast and you want to have more up, up and down. If you can raise it upward, see we're going we're to burn here on the edge. If you want to get a little more, see for, it's easy for me because I'm taller. But if you, if you point it downwards and kind of go for the areas that haven't already caramelized, kind of keep it moving, keep it moving around like so. Okay. Excellent. A little further back. The point actually extends quite far. It's got a six inch range there. And if it starts getting too dark too fast, let go. And now you can, yeah, but now you can recalculate. That's, that's the hottest point. That's where the torch is close. And my mom told me never to play with fire. A little lighter touch, maybe a little farther away. Have at it. Okay, but get comfortable with it first, you know, so you, get, you have to engage the burner. Pull back. Too close. Again, too close. You, gotta, you don't want to actually be moving the sugar around with the force of the gas. See if we can kind of redistribute this a little bit. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. In fact, here, if you back out, get it going, and then pull in. You can kind of, you can kind of feel where it's at. You pull back. So Try that out. You can, I can keep full on, just got to move back and. Yeah, keep it moving. That way you won't scorch the you. scorch it into a blackness. Hold on one second. There you go. Yeah, that's coming up real nice. Pretty, pretty cold at the bottom, it'll be slightly warm in the top, and it'll be cool as you work down towards the bottom. Although, it's hard to say, because this is a longer process doing it this way, I tend to do it faster up, up in the air like that. It might actually be warmer deeper into the custard, unknown. Okay. Perfect. They're smoking. <laughs> okay. Well, these are, these are actual brulees. All right, let's let these cool down and bring them up to speed with the other ones, which won't take very long. We were talking in back there as to whether or not, uh, how, how cold it is going to be. This is the ones we did earlier, and you can feel the, the bottom is still cool of the early one we did. Now this should be, we should have attained a crispness now at this one. Yeah, that crisped up real nicely, and still the bottom is cool. Let be old. So this fulfills the requirements of the dessert, and we're getting very close to the point we will be able to eat it. Have these? No, no, that's still a little bit. Okay, we're crisp up to this point. That one's done. These are molten. Oh, oh, that's an earlier one. Okay, good. That one. Is that, uh... Yeah! Okay, just these two. And we just, we just did those. So these are ready to rock and roll. If somebody would like to crack in and explore these things, feel I free. Would. I would. Yeah, yeah. Okay, everybody line up over There's here. There's another spoon. Line up over here. Is there everybody can get a taste, for sure. You can't have individual ones. There's not enough for that. But there's certainly enough for everybody to have a taste or two. Has anyone here ever had creme brulee before at a restaurant or anything like that? Anybody make it at home? Okay. This is considered a really classic, simple but elegant dessert, a nice closer to dinner. It is, of course, very rich, so you don't want to have these big giant ones unless you're sharing it amongst uh, a number of people because it'd be just simply too rich. As we're enjoying our creme brulees, we would like to thank Megan Dawson, Jim Terry, and all the folks here at hy -Vee. Thanks for joining us on Kids in the Kitchen.